Welcome to day two of the 2020 Fall Technology Innovation Forum. I'm Bill Allison, Berkeley CTO, and your host as we showcase the Berkeley Technology Innovation Program. You can rewatch individual talks or the entire webcast from the first day at cto.berkeley.edu slash innovation. We will also make today's content available after the event as well. Berkeley is known as the home of innovation and for pushing the frontiers of knowledge. What we aim to do with this program is to connect those academic innovations happening all around us to the operation and administration of the university. The CTO Innovation Program has three efforts. Yesterday, we showcased some of the progress being made by awardees for the first part of the program, Berkeley Changemaker Technology Innovation Grants. The grant program launched in February to fund proof of value experiments that support our university mission and align with the spirit of Berkeley Changemaker. The second part of the program and our focus today is the Berkeley Connected Campus Initiative that explores and engages the concepts, challenges, and dilemmas behind smart cities to create new experiences and efficiencies for our own campus. Finally, the third part of the innovation program, student impact partnerships, give technology support to organizations that support student innovation, such as Berkeley Changemaker and the Blum Center. We also learned about that yesterday. The Fall Technology Innovation Forum was originally planned as a day-long in-person event at the MLK Center. With the stress on our community as we collectively respond to the coronavirus pandemic, we've adopted Carol Christ's charge of do less with less. We took this as a challenge to be better editors, focusing on what matters the most and what makes Berkeley great. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy the event. Many presenters are here live in the chat to engage in dialogue and answer your questions. But before we get started, let's talk for a moment about the Connected Campus. There are a growing number of smart city as well as smart campus initiatives across the country, and these can generate efficiencies, improve public safety, afford personalized experiences, and improve the operation and use of physical assets, all while collecting and storing actionable data about the interactions between people and things in the environment. Sustainability and preventing or mitigating environmental and health risks are among the applications we'll see today. In IT, we buy, build, and maintain the infrastructure that supports these devices and services. But while the potential of smart campuses and cities and the ever-expanding market for technology generates enthusiasm, it also understandably generates concern. Furthermore, the value of smart devices requires cross-campus coordination to encourage and ensure coherent user experiences. Recognizing this, how do we promote the thoughtful orchestration of technologies to amplify human potential and increase our agency without compromising autonomy and privacy? Our nascent Berkeley Connected Campus investigates available technologies, explores their potential with campus's key infrastructure partners, parking and transportation, facilities, environmental health and safety. The Berkeley Connected Campus initiative is partnering with the privacy and security experts and policy experts at academic organizations like Citrus to develop a more scalable approach to what is already a proliferation of smart technologies being deployed today ad hoc on campus. The UC Berkeley approach also distinguishes itself from other smart campus and smart city initiatives by its people-first design ethos. By this, I mean a collaborative design process that emphasizes inclusivity and empowerment for the community as a whole. Today's format features talks from some people involved in building connected campus services, followed by a panel discussion that will dig into some of these themes. Let's kick off a series of short presentations from our connected campus project leaders. Let's start with Karen Lobo from Facilities Services talking about our new machine learning equipment sensors. Hello, everyone. I'm Karen Lobo, Director of Maintenance and Operations, and with me today is Todd McFerrin, Manager of the Electrical and Lighting Shops. Good morning. Todd will be the Implementation Project Manager for the Smart Sensor Project. Thanks to Connected Campuses grant, Facility Services will install 57 smart Samsara sensors on high value and critical equipment. These sensors function as early warning fault detection on critical equipment. And this is the gold standard in the maintenance industry. And we're very happy that we're moving in this direction and thankful to Connected Campus. Currently, Facility Services operates under a reactive maintenance model. We do perform some preventive maintenance, but it's not always driven by digital diagnostics, 
Rather, the maintenance is on preset schedules and visual inspections by mechanics. There can be inherent waste in this type of model because maintenance on equipment is performed either too frequently or infrequently. If it's too frequent, it leads to increased labor and material costs and unnecessary landfill waste. If it's not frequent enough, it can lead to equipment failure and business interruption and nobody's happy with that. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Todd for a real life example. Thank you, Karen. Currently, if a motor that supports a supply or exhaust fan fails, the process is as follows. Facilities is alerted of the problem and what building the problem is at. A mechanic responds to investigate the issue. If they find that a motor failed, they need to obtain a current quote from one of our vendors, then process it through procurement and wait for the motor to arrive, which usually takes several weeks. In the meantime, the building's air system is not balanced. This introduces different potential hazards, such as security risks from doors not closing, or sometimes animals need to be relocated. Karen will go into how our solution will change this. So we're partnering with Samsara sensors. They are non-invasive technology to help improve maintenance optimization. The sensors monitor and detect vibrations on large critical equipment. And if abnormal conditions occur, we'll send real-time alerts to facilities before the equipment fails. This will allow facility services to be proactive and we believe save the university money spent on unplanned maintenance and breakdowns, uh, equipment downtime, energy, and help with utilization of personnel more effectively. Todd's gonna to talk a little bit about the proposed locations and equipment. Thank you. We selected five buildings, Berkeley Way West, Chu Hall, Haas Business Faculty Wing, Likashin, and Northwest Animal. In most cases, we will install sensors on critical equipment where there is no redundancy, or if failure occurs, there would be a catastrophic impact to research. With, with pre-warning of potential failures on equipment, we now have time to order new equipment and schedule an outage with the department. We identified the critical equipment by working with shop managers, shop leads, and asset managers, Cherry Chung and Karen Larson. If this test pilot is successful, it will help to transform our maintenance model to a predictive one rather than reactive, saving thousands of dollars in overtime and unscheduled reactive repairs. We plan to have the system fully functioning by mid-February 2020. Here's Karen. If this test pilot project is successful, as Todd mentioned, it will help the campus avoid business interruption from failed equipment, lost research and unforeseen repairs and numerous other related costs. The pilot project will install, as I mentioned, wireless sensors on assets and will monitor and alert facilities when a component is likely to fail. Maintenance staff will then perform the appropriate procedures to avoid the catastrophic failure. We think this is the future because we will be able to monitor the health and performance of the equipment 24 seven without making a physical visit. This technology enables us to establish vibration thresholds for each piece of equipment monitored and receive real time alerts when equipment deviates. The software will allow us to have custom dashboards perform trend analysis and set key performance indicators to give insights into bettering the efficiency and maintenance of equipment. We look forward to providing updates as we have signed a multi-year contract with the company and uh, we thank you for your time. Thank you. We will hear from Sarah Souza from Environment Health and Safety talking about error sensors. Hi, my name is Sarah Susan. I work with Environment, Health, and Safety. I'm here to provide an update on our PM2.5 air sensor project. Um, this was started in response to wildfire smoke impacts on campus. And last year, we had a couple sensors 
that are um, Wi-Fi and plug-in versions that were originally funded by UCOP Office of Risk Services. And through the Connected Campus effort, we were able to expand our network this year and add these solar powered and cellular transmitted devices um, in a number of places on campus, both indoors and outdoors. So this is a clarity sensor that is solar powered and transmits data via cellular networks through this antenna. There's an air inlet on the bottom that pulls air in and the optical sensor counts particles of diameter 2.5 microns or less, and that is what PM 2.5 stands for. It's the finer particulates um, in wildfire smoke that are the most harmful um, to people during wildfire smoke events. One challenge we've had with decision making on campus is that our reference monitors that are managed by government agencies are down at Berkeley Aquatic Park in downtown Oakland, um, and then there's another one further near the San Leandro border, and those aren't necessarily representative of our, air con of our conditions here on campus. So by adding sensors, we've been able to provide more local data in comparison to those reference monitors. Currently, we have these sensors installed on the roof of University Hall, the roof of VLSB, Stanley Hall, Lawrence Hall of Science, and Crossroads, and that really creates a representative um, network going up the hill, um, since again, our reference monitor is down at a per Berkeley Aquatic Park um, at bay level. That gives us much more data heading up the hill. Um, we've also installed some indoors at Lawrence Hall of Science, VLSB, and University Hall to be able to measure in real time the effectiveness of our building filtration systems. And this year, we were able to install some um, indoors for University Health Services, as well as the Early Childhood Education Centers, uh, which are very helpful to be able to, in real time again, measure the indoor air quality um, and also see the effectiveness of some controls, such as putting portable HEPA filters inside in certain areas that don't have um, HVAC systems and building filtration systems. So it's been interesting and rewarding to work on this project this year. Uh, our campus has been impacted for the last four years by wildfire smoke. So it's certainly a relevant issue and challenge for California. Um, some of the controls that we normally would have um, responded with uh, were limited due to our COVID policies, such as uh, pulling in 100% outdoor air in some of our buildings. So there certainly were some challenges this year and some pretty extreme conditions. Uh, for example, we had one week in September. Many people that were around will remember the day that was orange. The skies were orange because there was uh, smoke in the region, very high level smoke coming from the August complex in Mendocino National Forest. And then our air levels on campus actually weren't so bad that day, but then when conditions changed and that smoke dropped, we had some of the most extreme conditions we've ever um, recorded here on campus with an air quality index uh, well above 200 on campus. So looking at that data in real time and, and understanding the impacts of some of these wildfire smokes is important for campus and for all of us that live in this community. It's been helpful um, to see variations across campus. Certainly Lawrence Hall of Science is often an outlier compared to the rest of campus because it's higher up on the hill. And also Berkeley Aquatic Park, which is our reference monitor because it's down at the bay, um, often has very different conditions or they're earlier or later than what we're seeing on campus. So all that, all that data has been valuable to understand our local trends. If you're interested in viewing the data from these sensors, you can access the data points through our campus air quality map. So it's at the EHNS website, and you can click on any of the data points and then plot it in comparison to the other data points on campus or reference monitors. Or if you zoom out on the map, you can even compare it to other regional sensors in the Bay Area or across California. If you have questions or interested in the data or are working on similar projects, feel free to reach out to me via email. Thanks for your time. We'll now hear a talk from Environmental Health and Safety with Bernadette. Bernadette, over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Bernadette Santos, and with me is my colleague, Tim Pine. We are with the Office of Environment, Health, and Safety. Today, we will be talking about the latest innovations about water quality monitoring. Tim Pine will be talking about the need and improvements in this area first, and I will be talking about the Smart Cover Pilot Program after. 
Tim has been on the Berkeley campus for 20 plus years and has great perspectives on this topic. Thanks, Bernadette. Well, I have some good news and bad news for all of you who are watching. The good news is that incidents like this, this, uh, this gushing sewer manhole happened uh, a lot less frequency than that a lot less frequently than they did uh, 20 years ago when I was work first started working here. The bad news is when they do happen, um, the severity of these incidents is just as bad as it was way back then. And the key for us is early notification. The faster that EHS can respond to um, an incident like this, the more we can uh, have chances to mitigate the damage. And the problem has been that we've always relied on human eyes and ears to notice the bad thing happening and then call us. And that sometimes has resulted in major delays. And this incident, this fish kill occurred um, as recently as last year. Um, this was a firefighting foam uh, release that hit Cornices Creek and ended up wiping out nearly the entire steelhead trout population uh, down there at Albany Village. And a big factor was we didn't hear about it and didn't get down there until the damage was done. Um, also still happening with alarming frequency are water main breaks. Um, these are because we have aging infrastructure. We have a lot of construction going on in our area. And the problem with water main breaks is the chlorine in the drinking water that's gushing out uh, is equally toxic in an aquatic environment as well as all the sediment that's being released. And then if we uh, can get out there early enough, we can actually take measures like these uh, dechlor mats. These tablets actually um, deactivate the chlorine. And so that's important to get there quickly to deploy those. And if we don't hear about it, the worst case scenario is uh, this damaging flow goes all the way out to um, the bay. And then this is uh, the result. We have to actually put up signage all the way down to um, San Francisco Bay. And so the good news is, is there's technology now that uh, gives us early warning of these incidents. And Bernadette's going to talk about that. Thank you, Tim. So here's an example of our smart cover monitoring system. This one is installed underneath a manhole cover. We also have a few of these suspended up over the creek channel uh, monitoring our stormwater system. Some of the smart cover features include a satellite network, which allows us to have better connectivity when Wi-Fi or cellular is sparse or non-existent. It's battery powered, so the system's functional even in electrical outage and batteries last about two years before needing replacement. Uh, there's a dashboard which can be accessible by mobile or the web, and I'll show you a screenshot of this shortly. It has real-time monitoring, so the data, uh, we capture the data every 10 minutes and it sends alerts to the users if an alarm is triggered. Uh, we have trend alerts, which allows us to see and be notified of any upward or downward flow levels, rise and fall. We have the ultrasonic sensor, which is fairly accurate. It can record data up to one tenth of an inch, and this sensor allows us to visually monitor the creek, even in the dark. It has rain monitoring, so we can do an overlay with the rain data and um, our sanitary sewer data for regulatory purposes. And it has great customer service, so if we ever need to understand the data or troubleshoot, they're always available to help. So this is an example of the dashboard that we have uh, via the web. Um, as you can see, we have four sanitary sewer installations and three stormwater installations. This is an example of the chart that each system um, collects data. So as you can see on this day, we received an incident and this happened to be a foaming agent incident that went to the creek. What had happened was when this level was triggered, um, we received a text message to say, hey, there is a problem in this in this area, you should check it out. So what did we do? We, we had our facilities folks go to the area where we had a smart cover and they were able to see that there was a foaming agent incident. And you can see how bad it looks on the creek, it's just bubbles. So this is how it's supposed to look like in this area. So we've had many campus successes, including two sanitary sewer overflows prevented and two illicit discharges detected, including that foam agent incident. 
We've been able to mitigate potential property damage and regulatory fines. Our engineers and planning department also has a better understanding of our sewer system and stormwater system infrastructure. And facility services could also be redirected to other preventative maintenance issues um, and activities versus always constantly doing visual inspections at these high spot locations. So now my colleagues going to be talking about going into the future. Thanks, Bernadette. So what are we hoping to do now that we have this system? Well, first of all, we definitely want to secure more funding. So this is a soft uh, plea for anyone who's watching um, to help support this great uh, system that we already have the beginnings of and we'd like to do more. Secondly, the uh, technology uh, or the, the potential here is, is pretty vast. Right now, we're simply monitoring rise and fall in flow, but we have the opportunity to install other sem sensors going forward sensors such as those that measure turbidity or conductivity. There's even sensors available now in the market that can tell you whether there's a sheen of oil or grease floating on the surface of the water you're monitoring too. And then of course, we, um, we can use all the data we're starting to gather as a planning tool and as a design tool going forward as campus um, you know, begins to either replace or build out more of our sewer and stormwater infrastructure. And then lastly, you know, we want to use this tool to help us engage with the campus community about the need to, uh, you know, protect our creek. And we still encourage um, people to, anytime they're on campus, to put their eyes on the creek. And if you do happen to see something that doesn't look right, you, of course, can always call us and there's our EHS number. Um, for more information, you can certainly can reach out to either Bernadette or myself. We'd be happy to talk to you in detail about this. And the campus also has a really excellent um, Creeks website. You can see the URL right there. Um, we've got a page about monitoring and lots of other information about our watershed. And I want to make sure that um, I thank uh, Alicia Klatt. She's our EHS training and instructional design specialist for helping us put this together. And of course, our awesome facility services, utility plumbers, these are the folks that run out there any time of the day or night to make sure that everything's flowing properly and they can respond to any issues or alarms. So thanks very much for tuning in. Thank you. We kicked off the Berkeley Connected Campus Initiative after researching useful applications of smart technologies appropriate to our campus. In examining the many potential use cases across the university, traffic management had a clear potential as a proof of value project. Part of the challenge in building a smart campus is matching useful scenarios with technology and campus units who are interested and able to participate. I've met with many functional teams to explore potential improvements to our campus via the Connected Campus. And in all the presentations you've heard today, success required a willing functional sponsor, suitable technology, and a real value to the unit and the university. For the technology solution we're about to hear, Dell and NTT offered a traffic flow proof of concept pilot. When I proposed this to Seamus at Parking and Transportation, he was an enthusiastic partner and collaborator. He developed a proposal, one of the first for the connected campus using the Amazon future press release format I described yesterday. But after doing that, he said, Bill, this project actually makes so much sense that the unit will fund it itself if you will contribute some of your time to making sure that technology works. I see the CTO role in part as a catalyst for digital transformation, and I'm thrilled to see the fruits of this initiative. I'll now turn it over to Seamus to describe this interesting pilot featuring observation and classification of traffic patterns for better curb management. This is Seamus Wilmot, the Director of Parking and Transportation, here to give you a quick update on a curb management study um, that we're doing in partnership with NTT and Dell. So what we're looking at is the curb along Bancroft at MLK and Eshelman. And um, we're going to quickly review the current state, which um, this was pre-COVID. We're calling the current state, but it was pre-COVID. Um, but it was one of the busiest routes for AC transit. We have ride-hailing pickup and drop-off. We have campus and uh, other shuttles, the campus store, MLK, Eshelman, um, and Zellerbach Hall. As a quick reminder, it's right along here. Uh, Bancroft and the area that we're really studying and we were able to put some NTT and Dell sensors was this intersection, the entrance to the Lower Sproul Garage um, that uh, is a very busy area. 
And to give you a sense of what it looks like before COVID, so in what was what used to be the normal times, this is Bancroft Way looking east. This is Eshelman Hall here. And um, what we find is that there's already a delivery truck in the bus only lane. We have a UPS truck that's clogging one of the um, drive uh, lanes. And the only thing we have left is this Sharrow, which is a um, bike lane and um, car lane. So what does this do? What does this do to traffic? Well, here we have a bus that's going around the delivery truck. Um, there's another bus stuck behind the delivery truck. And we have a pedestrian who's just crossing in the middle of the street. Then we have, just a couple of seconds later, we have cars that have to move out into the only uh, uh, available drive lane because the UPS truck is in the way. We, that bus is still stuck behind the delivery truck. And we have a bicyclist weaving in and out of the cars. Not very safe at all. Again, a different day, but we have a truck uh, stuck uh, uh, unloading its delivery right here in the bus stop. We have folks waiting at the bus stop, waiting for the bus that's never going to be able to get to them. This same bake mark truck is halfway into the intersection that is the entrance to the Lower Sproul Garage. We now have um, a delivery truck on either side of this intersection. This one stuck uh, at a fire hydrant um, delivering its goods. This car is trying to get out of Lower Spell Garage. We have people crossing back and forth and trucks on either side of this intersection. Again, same situation. This is one of my favorites. This truck actually broke our clearance bar, um, but still had to get its delivery done. So it just stopped and clogged the whole drive aisle um, that was getting uh, in and out of Lower Spell Garage. So how do we um, take a look at this? Well, we asked NTT and Dell to come in and um, they installed some sensors. Again, the data they're able to do and analyze is during COVID, so it's uh, definitely skewed. But they took a look at traffic flow and congestion. They were able to identify the types of vehicles going by, help us determine the dwell time, meaning how much time somebody is spending at the curb, what's causing con the congestion, and what does it just basically look like out there. So here's one of the cameras, it's looking east, and it's able to identify this was a bus. And this uh, picture is the second camera that's looking southward towards Blackwell Hall. Again, it's able to identify a car, identify pedestrians, another car that just went by. Here, a skateboarder would have to go behind this car that was in the crosswalk, another car going westward on Bancroft. But not only were the sensors able to tell what type of car, but they were just counting the cars for us as well. So here's a, a seven day look at the cars going by in hourly chunks. And what we thought was going to be the peak uh, time was going to be during the noon hour, sort of uh, people in the middle of the day. But what we're finding, and again, this is during COVID time, we're finding that in the evenings, that sort of five to 9 p.m. is the busiest time. So here's 7 p.m. We have 230 cars that went through in that hour. Um, so it's fairly interesting that in the evenings definitely is the uh, busy time at this intersection. And what type of cars are going by? So the sensors, um, the NTT sensors are able to tell us that, okay, the majority are standard vehicles, um, and then about 8% are buses and public transportation, which is great to see that that's uh, on the uptick. This is during the month of September. Um, and we have delivery trucks and emergency vehicles and, and just other, uh, other types of vehicles. But which, what's causing the congestion? Again, this is during COVID time, so the traffic flow is much lower than normal, um, but parallel parking causes a lot of congestion. People are not good at uh, parking their cars, uh, especially parallel parking. Um, the bus lane, um, the traffic light, but here, temporary parking. People doing that double parking or pulling over to the curb and um, dropping somebody off that slows down a bus. That's what's causing the traffic congestion. So what are we gonna do? What's the future? Well, we're hoping that these sensors, as part of our pilot, that we can um, we can figure out a way to have them help us decrease congestion. Can they help us manage deliveries? Can we now use these sensors to be able to uh, force delivery trucks to actually reserve a space on the curb? And um, we can tell them the time. You can only use that curb between 8.30, uh, before 8.30 in the morning. And you have to reserve that time. So it was only one truck delivering at a time. So we don't have three or four trucks clogging up the road. Can we monetize the curb? You know, people have been uh, traditionally driving and parking their cars, um, but um, you know, the, the future really seems to be that, uh, you know, the ride share and you just come, you drop off um, at the curb and you get out of the car, you get into the car at the curb. 
And so, uh, and then also, can we replicate this around to other locations around campus, at the West Crescent or up by the business school or over at Northgate, um, other locations where we have lots of uh, pedestrians and bicycles and buses all um, uh, uh, going through the same intersection at the same time. Um, can we use these sensors um, to really help us manage those areas? And that's the hope. And that's why we'll keep working with Dell and NTT to see um, how we can do in phase two of our pilot. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining our panel on the Connected Campus. Uh, what all the people have uh, in common on this panel is that they understand policy and also the role of incentives in shaping desired outcomes. All too often when we talk about things like smart cities and campuses, the conversation stays centered on the technology or it focuses on a desired outcome. So the panel here has a lot of expertise in achieving outcomes while thinking about complexity and what are the second and third order effects of our technology decisions. So let me begin by making some introductions. We are joined today by Brandy Nanecki, who is the founding director of the Citrus Policy Lab. She's also a fellow at the Harvard Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. Uh, welcome, Brandy. Kira, uh, thank you for joining us. This is Kira Stoll, our UC Berkeley Chief Sustainability Officer and our Carbon Solutions Officer, which I only learned we had when I was putting together the panel. Uh, Scott Seaborn, welcome. Uh, Scott is our Berkeley Campus Privacy Officer. And so I thought our discussion could take a different approach to discussing the Internet of Things and how Berkeley can take advantage of it by starting with our goals and objectives as a public research university. So Kira, uh, let's start with you. And maybe just to begin with, can you tell us a little bit about your role and how the university thinks about sustainability? So um, thank you, uh, Bill, and uh, very happy to be joining this panel um, to, to discuss these issues. Um, so, you know, sustainability has been actually part of the ethos of the Berkeley campus for a very long time. We didn't always call it sustainability, but, you know, there was moves, um, you know, back in the 1960s and the 70s when the environmental movement started taking traction federally um, and California was, um, hit with a number of issues around drought and, um, uh, and, and energy um, issues and um, oil embargoes and oil spills. And uh, so, you know, we have actually kind of a long legacy of looking at these issues from energy, transportation and water, but the, um, it really took traction in um, the early 2000s, uh, much in part from students that really wanted the university operations and administration to respond and reflect what we were doing in terms of our mission as a university in academics and research. And from there, a really robust UC system-wide uh, sustainability um, movement happened. We have a policy that has 10 sections in it, guiding what we're supposed to do around um, sustainability across UC and Berkeley in almost every case kind of exceeds um, those policies. So in my role as uh, the chief sustainability officer and looking at carbon solutions for the campus, I'm focused mostly on the campus operations with you know, drawing lines as I can to the academic and the research mission, but really looking at ways that we can be a resource smart um, and a, a conscientious um, environmental um, campus and provide leadership uh, just like we do in the academics. Thank you, Kira. Um, Scott, so let's turn to you. Uh, tell me about the role of the campus privacy officer. What do you do at Berkeley and how much of your job relates to technology and privacy? Thanks, Bill. And thanks for inviting me to participate in the panel. The campus privacy function here at UC Berkeley has a number of different roles. Uh, a lot of it has to do with compliance. So making sure that the campus complies with state and federal privacy laws, uh, in addition to our own UC policies and privacy values. Uh, so we do everything from reviewing policies, reviewing um, data collection practices, uh, monitoring practices to make sure that they're uh, compliant with state and federal law. And also they're not overbearing in terms of how much information is collected. Um, we also work on the transparency report that uh, Bill was instrumental in uh, developing. It's an initiative that involves uh, making public every time we access personal data, personal information. Uh, in terms of this project or these kinds of projects, um, 
So I think our role is really advisory. Uh, we can provide um, different feedback uh, streams or provide different uh, mechanisms for um, reviewing projects uh, to make sure they're not, there isn't too much data collected. We're being transparent about what's collected. If it's shared with other entities, especially external entities, there are some controls that are put in place. Uh, so we're really kind of, um, let's say like an advisory organization that uh, makes sure that each of these projects uh, complies with state and federal law and also our earthly privacy values. Thank you, Scott. So Brandy, uh, can you tell us a bit about Citrus and your role in founding the Citrus Policy Lab? Uh, and uh, especially I'd like to hear how Citrus approaches navigating a balance between the potential and the risks inherent uh, when new technologies are being adopted. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for hosting this panel. So I am Brandy Nonicky. I direct the Citrus Policy Lab, which is headquartered at UC Berkeley under Citrus and the Banatau Institute, which is actually a four campus institute we're also on the campuses of UC Davis, UC Merced, and UC Santa Cruz. The Citrus Policy Lab supports interdisciplinary tech policy research and engagement with the goal of supporting evidence-based policymaking, not only in the public sector, but also in the private sector, uh, especially because a lot of the governance that's in play on emerging technologies happens within the private sector. Um, so the question you posed about how do we balance, you know, the promise and peril of technology, uh, I think it, it comes from supporting that interdisciplinary research where you connect the individuals who are thinking about the newest, greatest, most innovative technology, and you're going to partner them with people who are thinking about what are the potential benefits and the potential risks of deploying these technologies and what are the appropriate uh, sort of levers that we need to pull to make sure that we are maximizing the development of that technology to support benefit while mitigating those risks. Um, so I encourage people to check out the work of the Citrus Policy Lab at citruspolicylab.org. Um, you can see our, our recent research publications on the website. So Scott, how do you see policy come to life at Berkeley and sort of go from an idea to, you know, Berkeley is not a top-down place. How, how does your role work with that? And, and you know, what are the issues that you see right now with all this organic adoption of technology? That's a great point. Uh, it's definitely not a top-down place. Um, when you're in a compliance role at Berkeley, it can be a little difficult because all these different initiatives and programs develop uh, organically across the campus um, and you don't have as much visibility as you might want to. Um, you also don't know all the key players sometimes, even if you're familiar with uh, leaders and departments, there's different uh, groups that are doing their own thing. So um, a lot of times it's just building awareness of the role of privacy office, what we do, uh, working with campus partners. We're really lucky that there is a campus uh, privacy group, the Campus Information Security Privacy Committee, CISPC, uh, that has members from different departments across the campus. Um, so they really keep us informed of the projects and also work directly with um, you know, principal investigators, uh, different research organizations, uh, different uh, campus departments to uh, build or kind of bake in privacy practices um, as projects are developing. So uh, the European Union, uh, GDPR, I'm not sure if people are familiar with that, uh, General Data Protection Regulation has uh, a concept called privacy by design, where instead of looking at a project or a data collection stream um, after the fact, while the project's being developed, privacy controls are put in place. So I think that's one of the things we try and do here. And uh, we've been really lucky that uh, a lot of the campus partners are already doing that or, or letting us know if there's a a new data collection or monitoring program um, so we can provide input. I'd actually like to piggyback on Scott's um, comment about CISPC, the Campus Information Security Privacy Committee. Uh, the work that they do, I think, is incredibly valuable and important. And one of the main reasons is because it promotes this diversity of viewpoint. There are individuals on that committee from all of the different departments and colleges and units. There's faculty, there's staff. Um, so I think that that work is really important in any other university tuning in. Uh, I'm certain they probably have similar committees on their campus, but I just want to emphasize that having these types of committees are incredibly important for helping to guide the appropriate procurement, development, implementation, and monitoring of these IoT tools on campuses. That's interesting, and it, it makes it, it raises the question for me, Brandy, of when there's an, a, a technology evolution and there is emerging technology and the implications aren't understood, 
how do those groups evolve or how, how do you help us have the right conversation? So when a new thing, a vendor comes in and offers us something, how do we, how do we get, how do we raise awareness of what we're stepping into? Yeah, I think first and foremost, you have to do some scenario thinking. You have to think through what are the potential pitfalls of this technology and bringing together the individ you know, individuals with a diversity of viewpoints are better equipped to be able to think of those edge cases that somebody in one discipline might not think of. Um, so I think really you have to do this sort of scenario thinking. Um, they sometimes call it, this is very common in cybersecurity uh, areas of research where you try to map out what are the greatest potential harms that are possible, kind of, you know, figure out what are the known unknowns uh, that you can investigate. In a, in a real life example, Kira, when you are looking at new initiatives, um, and, and there's been a bunch that have come through your program, how, I, I suppose you, scenario planning is sort of what you do also, because on the uh, scoping out of the benefits of new technology, you're looking at things. How, if we're trying to sort of think holistically about how to, to, to deal with the privacy and other issues, what as a key stakeholder leading you know, the adoption of some of these technologies, how should we make that easy for you, you know, when you're going to kick off a program like Big Belly? And maybe actually you should start by telling people what Big Belly is in case they don't know. Sure. Um, so um, I will uh, say that the Big Bellies are, um, they are exterior waste uh, disposal bins um, that we put in place on campus. So Whoever thought that uh, garbage would be so exciting, but it was a very exciting initiative. And I'll talk a little bit more about it, but I first want to uh, kind of address the kind of the big picture when we're when we're looking at um, bringing in a new program or service, um, and then there's a, a data component to it. And oftentimes, you know, we're coming at it from two points. One, we want to kind of embed this into the culture and the operations of what we're doing. So we definitely look at how are people going to be interacting with whatever we're bringing on board? How does it interact with the person? And then because projects like the Big Bellies are so operationally focused, we also have to look at through the operations lens in terms of what do we already know about, you know, something like the waste streams that we have. So using the data that we have to understand how a new tool will fit in. And then also being very careful when we bring new technology on that it's something that we can support and it's something that we can maintain over time. And so then that also gets us into contractual thinking, right? Is this something that we need to manage ourselves and can learn, or is this something that we really want to have as a service uh, along with a new tool? So just using the big bellies as an example, picture a, you know, a, a bin in Sproul Plaza at Berkeley. It's got you know three containers attached with it. It's got solar panels on the top of it. You can put organic materials, recycling, and landfill in. Um, and um, now you're asking the user to make that choice and help us, you know, sort that sort that waste. And um, we were kind of driven to these particular units. Um, probably, I, I wouldn't say the primary reason was the 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 uh, the electronic ability or the, the data ability um, to it, but that it one it was going to help us accomplish our zero waste goals, which are to eliminate landfill on campus by actually offering the public a way to properly dispose of their materials. And that we had this terrible system on campus of these bins that were open, um, critters would get in them. I mean, you know, so we kind of also had a messy campus uh, because of that. And so um, we saw those solutions um, here with this. What we got, and we did contemplate as we put the contracts in place, how long is the service contract for? Who owns the data? Are we going to be able to read the data? How is this? If if this these this this system gives us real time information, are we really going to be able to take advantage of it? If we know a bin is full, do we really even have the staff to go out there and take care of this? And so, um, you know, the long. The long story short is that the decision the campus made to move to these um, ha has had multiple benefits. It, it took us a while, but we've been able to streamline some of the operations. We've been able to kind of reduce pickup services. So there's been a savings in maintenance. We've been able to eliminate materials like bags inside. So saving money and saving uh, resources. 
Our diversion rate is getting a little bit better. So we're getting a little bit better sorting um, of the materials. And we're also seeing a lot less trash floating around, a lot less pollution in Strawberry Creek. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's overall good how we use what we understand from this new system, I think is still a question out there and an ongoing question for any programs we put in place. As can, are we really using what we, this data that we're gathering from these programs um, to our advantage? Thank you, Kira. So what data do you collect and how much of it is used to make decisions? But we do know what our diversion rates are. So we do understand when we're emptying those bins, how much contamination there might be. So if there's too much contamination in an organics waste stream, we have to send it to the landfill. Um, what we're finding though, is that the contamination levels are particularly low so that we really haven't seen that, um, that issue. Uh, and uh, I think um, we've been able to, like I had mentioned before, streamline some of the operations because we know through this system when the bins are full and when they're not. Um, the other thing that it's, it's, it's re we can reveal, these are things we knew anecdotally, but it's become more obvious with this system is that if the surrounding community doesn't have something similar, you know, we have a very porous border. So, you know, materials coming in, you know, from the city, if they're not running a similar system, we're, there's, we're, we're not, we're not able to um, have as positive a result um, if, if there's a, dis, if that's disjointed. I'd like to piggyback on Kira's point earlier um, in regards to who owns the data, who controls the data. Um, it's something I think that comes up a lot um, and it sounds like it's come up with this project. Uh, when you're working with a vendor or any sort of outside organization, um, it's really important to put in contract terms that UC Berkeley, whoever is running the program, UC Berkeley in this case, um, has control over that data. So when the program's over, the vendor will return or destroy the data. Um, if there's any disclosures that are necessary to an external party that we have control over that. So I think that's an excellent that uh, Kira's team was thinking about that when working uh, with vendors and putting that language in the contract. So you, it sounds almost like you're referring to the famous or infamous Appendix DS, um, <laughs> this data security attachment to all the procurement. And I wonder what you do when a technology works in a way that's sort of incompatible with, say, the way that document was written now several years ago. Um, what, where do you get pulled in and what do those conversations look like? Yeah, there, there's been a few situations um, this past year when the language in Appendix DS doesn't really uh, work. So you have situations where Appendix DS is really written sometimes, or you can think of it as uh, written for a data set that is in one fixed location. Um, there aren't multiple users accessing it from various points. Um, so a lot of times we will add in language uh, in regards to putting access controls in uh, to systems using the data. There's portals making sure that they're also secure um, and really making sure that the vendor passes on any of their security requirements to other parties. Because um, in many cases, it's not just the vendor that has access. They can't even control sometimes who has access to the data. So yeah, that's, that's very important. And sometimes we can do it and sometimes we have to escalate that process uh, up to the campus leadership. So um, thank you, Scott. Brandy, um, so you think about this a lot uh, in your academic work and at a very high level. I, I know you've done work with the World Economic Forum, for example, advising them on their AI uh, procurement in a box. It seems that's very relevant to the discussion here. And you know, what do we do when a vendor says, sorry, Scott, uh, we're not accepting your terms and conditions. We, have, we think of ourselves as a large institution, but uh, is there a bigger opportunity for us and how can Berkeley play into that? Yeah, thank you for bringing up procurement. That is, I think, one of the strongest uh, levers we have on influencing how these technologies will operate on our campus. And I think, you know, unfortunately, if the vendor says we can't comply, then we say, oh, well, unfortunately, we can't work with you. Um, the UC system, if you think of it in its entirety of all 10 campuses, this is a, a huge uh, sector for them to, to work in. And so if we set standards, I, I think that 
would compel them to follow in order to be able to access our campuses. I also want to touch on on data and thinking about that in the procurement guidelines, um, especially you know when Scott was bringing up privacy by design principles. Um, also, I'd like to talk about data minimization uh, as a part of a privacy by design principle that ensuring these entities are only collecting the data that is necessary for them to perform the function that they're intending to uh, implement and that they're clear that only the data they need is the data they collect. Um, and I, I think also there's an important consideration about data sharing, uh, data ownership. Uh, is data being shared with any additional third parties? Does the campus have ownership of that data? Um, you know, How does the vendor gain access to that data to improve its models and processes in those agreements that are put in place? So, yeah, I think procurement is one of the most important levers. And I would recommend individuals check out the World Economic Forum's procurement in a box guidelines. They're extremely helpful. They are targeted toward government entities uh, procuring AI technologies, but the recommendations, the, the guides, the you know, they even come up with questions to help individuals who are procuring the technology, questions that you should be asking vendors. They have a whole list. It's extremely helpful and I think very relevant to campuses also looking to implement uh, emerging technologies. Well, I, you know, if I just might add to that, it's very interesting because in the procurement area, um, oftentimes when I'm looking at something, I'm looking at how transparent we can be with the data or how much we can make that data available to the public so that they can interact with it um, as well. And so I think um, that that line between, you know, what's private and being collected, um, the privacy piece, and then what we want to share out, um, you know, you know, to to make change um, and transformation is really important. So, you know, we've been, you know, I've been on projects where we've been installing solar panels, they're third party owned and operated, but we wanted to make sure that the real time data was available to the public if they wanted to see um, how those panels were performing. Um, uh, and then I think the other piece I'd add to the data and the procurement piece is that also working with our vendors so that they can help us collect um, in, a, in a sane way, the data we need to understand how things are performing. Because oftentimes there's, maybe like too much data or there's a, a particular one two or three items we really need to understand and having the vendor working with us um, on those data pieces so maybe this is a question go ahead brandy yeah i was going to piggyback up uh, on that and i think um you raise a really good point here about maybe they're collecting too much data. There's like this data overload. And at some point it's just too much. You can't gain anything meaningful from it. Um, and I think that that is an important consideration that, you know, just because you can implement a technology or just because you can collect the data doesn't necessarily mean that you should. Um, so I think this also ties back to our earlier discussion about these privacy committees. Uh, I think that those committees are really well positioned to help consider uh, in obviously in partnership with the entities on campus that are implementing these technologies who actually know the data that they need, but to ask those tough questions about do you really need to collect that data in order for you to streamline your process to achieve X, Y, and Z objectives. And that, and that actually raises another question, and I'm not sure this may be for everybody on the group, is do we collect the data is, is a question. And I guess another question with technology is, do we even want a technology solution for something in this space? And so asking that question of things rather than, um, than sometimes adopting the technology, which maybe we're seeking for one scenario, but it actually contains a lot of other aspects within it. Um, you know, how should the university think about that when it comes to a smart campus uh, and the idea of uh, what we're calling a connected campus, because we're again trying to shape that, um, our purpose around it. Yeah, I think that's a really uh, good question. And sometimes there's a conflict between the idea that this technology exists and we might as well use it. Um, and then the practical side of things, maybe there's a better way to do this the old fashioned way or the old school way. Um, thinking about the COVID-19 situation and some of the uh, projects or initiatives that have been raised to keep track of who's on campus and what buildings they're in. Um, uh, some of the proposals that come up are really exciting in terms of using Wi-Fi data uh, to determine who's in campus buildings and things like that. But um, 
sometimes just having someone uh, campus monitor, <laughs> keeping track of the numbers of people in the building, uh, in some ways is easier. So that's just one example where the technology solution isn't always the best solution, or in this case, it actually might be, but um, you know, there's something to think, think about uh, from a privacy standpoint. In most cases, the analog solution is, is better. <laughs> so um, you know, sometimes you collect too much data, you may be collecting data, uh, as Brandy pointed out, that you don't need, you, you want to minimize it. And when you have that extra data sitting around, there's uh, that much more chance that it'll be shared inappropriately or disclosed inappropriately. In the beginning part of the conversation, uh, Brandy, you talked about um, the CISPC committee and how it included a lot of different voices. And so we're able to see different aspects of a problem and sort of engage in it. I, I'm thinking about how do we think about inclusivity as a whole in, in the technology choices and how they shape our, our physical architecture on the campus as well as our IT architecture. And um, when we're purchasing things, do they affect the inclusivity of our campus? Uh, what a good question, Bill. Yes, I think so. I think all technology uh, inherently has, you know, inclusivity barriers and opportunities. And so when we're thinking about those technologies and evaluating whether or not we should procure them, we should try to come to that decision by including the diversity of viewpoints and diversity of abilities that people have who interact on our campus. I'll just give one example. It's not a really smart um, IoT device, but even, you know, um, hand soap dispensers or um, like Purell <laughs> dispensers, sometimes those sensors won't recognize darker skin tones. That's obviously not something that, that we want. I think while the, this is one small example, that can be scaled to other types of technologies that are in use that may disproportionately not work on certain um, individuals. So we have to think about whether or not these technologies are fit for purpose for all, uh, all of our campus community. In the life cycle of, say, with Cura, working on sustainability, how do we make sure that we inject the right conversations and considerations and make that easy? Um, I guess, and you could hear from all of you, including Cura, on like, you know, these, these are hard initiatives to do. It's hard to figure out even sometimes who all the stakeholders are. How do we, um, what can we do to have the right conversations around the technology decisions with something like this when it might not even be viewed as a technology decision? A great question. And, um, you know, thinking about it just from the procurement lens um, and the sustainability aspect of it, um, the U University of California system now has a uh, policy, sustainability policy, that says if you're going out for a request for proposal um, of a th certain threshold, that 15% of your evaluation cr criteria needs to be based on sustainability, and that can be environmental, social, um, or economic sustainability. And so there's already, there's this new lever that's been built into um, our procurement process. And um, I've just gone through an RFP process myself, and it was very interesting to look at the sustainability criteria opportunity, which is so open and it could be a diverse supplier to, you know, they've built their headquarters that it's a green building, um, you know, that they report transparently. It's, it's very broad right now. So there could be a real opportunity here to talk about because so much so much of what we're procuring today has some sort of technological piece to it to start defining what does what does inclusion mean even if it, it through a sustainability lens yeah just really quick drawing upon the work um that the world economic forum has put forward i think yeah it's cure pointed out it's especially if you have projects over a certain threshold where you can implement some of these requirements. And I think that she brought up an excellent point about defining inclusion across different areas, uh, racial, you know, um, gender, age, all the different types of inclusivity. And then thinking through, it may be in partnership with a committee like CISPC, I'm not sure if that's the relevant committee that should do this, but coming up with a set of questions that helps the individuals who are procuring the technology to ask so that they're questioning whether or not that technology is likely to be inclusive of those various categories is, I think, a huge help for uh, procurement. Scott? I think that's a great idea. Um, and kind of piggybacking off that, um, the other thing that uh, we're trying to do more of is to solicit feedback from uh, users who will have the experience or whose data will be collected especially uh, underrepresented users who maybe 
uh, haven't had a chance to provide feedback in the past. Um, so I think that's something that we're working on. We're trying to engage student groups uh, at the SISPC. We have two students on the SISPC, but trying to do a better job of working with uh, various student populations uh, to make sure that their voices are heard and um, if there's any sort of potential bias, for example, uh, that we can address that. So I, this actually raises another question for me, which is if we're putting a lens on the connected campus and sort of Internet of Things type applications, um, how, how should we think about establishing a toolkit for that? And, and, and how do we interleave these existing policies into something like that? Does it, is it even the right way of drawing the boundary around thinking about something? Or, you know, or is Internet of Things a component of these other policies? Like you could kind of look at it from different angles and what's in your experience and, and research, what's the, how, what's the most effective way to approach that kind of thing? I don't have a response exactly directly to that, but one of the you know things to kind of point out and be able to kind of weave the connections in there is that we have some really urgent issues that we need to address, and that I think this Internet of Things and this connected campus concept, um, if we could sort through some of the issues or the challenges with it, is going to be so instrumental for us making being able to make really rapid positive shifts. I mean, we, you know, we have budget constraints right now, a pandemic, a climate crisis, a biodiversity crisis. We have so many things um, that, and it's so um, kind of difficult sometimes to get messaging out or, or understand how we can bring people together and get, you know, opinions um, that we can really use this connected campus um, idea to really help us make, make decisions. Um, and, so, and it seems like there's so many great pieces that we have right now. There just needs to be, we need to make some kind of strong, stronger connections to help us do that more quickly. Um, any, any final thoughts from, from people before we uh, wrap up? Brandy, maybe a last word? I was just going to add that yeah, I think Kira is spot on. I think that there's this great opportunity for lesson sharing across entities on the UC Berkeley campus that are implementing these technologies, sort of the best practices where they've seen, you know, also where things didn't work out um, and sharing those best practices in a type of toolkit. I'm a, I'm a big proponent for toolkit. I think that they're very helpful. If not the end all, they're a really good starting point, I think for organizations to be able to you know, ramp up projects. So I just wanted to say, I think that that's an excellent idea. Well, thank you all. And, and that was actually a great note to end the panel on because this is sort of the end of the conference and our theme of innovation in the time of coronavirus. So innovation is gonna happen whether or not we apply any management to it, even as difficult as the times are. So I'm glad that you all convened to help us think about how to do things uh, so we could do less with less and still keep everything running and keep Berkeley what it is, uh, what it is. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Before we end the program today, I would be remiss not to thank some of the many collaborators who have contributed to the Fall Technology Innovation Forum's Connected Campus webcast. We are partnered with Citrus and the Citrus Policy Lab. A big thank you to Executive Director Camille Crittenden and Brandy Nanaki, who is the founding director of the Citrus Policy Lab and a fellow at Harvard's Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. Thank you to Sally McGarrahan, the Associate Vice Chancellor for Facilities, and to her team, including Karen Lobo, Director of Facilities Operations, and Felix DeLeon, the Director of Maintenance Operations, both of whom are involved with Connected pro Campus Projects. Thank you to Pat Goff, the Executive Director environmental health and safety, and to the amazing EHNS team who've been so instrumental to our progress. A big thanks to Sarah Souza, Eric Knight, Bernadette Rosero, Duke Tong Santos, and Tim Pine. Thank you to Seamus Wilmot for the Executive Director of Parking and Transportation for his partnership and the great talk we just heard. Uh, thank you to UC Berkeley Chief Sustainability and Carbon Solutions Officer Kira Stoll for her engagement and support and joining us on the panel. Thank you to Campus CISO, our Chief Information Security Officer, Allison Henry. Allison and her whole amazing team are great partners um, in keeping us all secure. Thank you to Gabriel Gonzalez, the CIO at the law school, and he's also the chair of the Campus Information Security and Privacy Committee we referenced in the panel. Thank you to Campus Privacy Officer, Scott Seaborn, for all his work and collaborative thought on how to address privacy issues 
with the Connected Campus and everything else. Scott, uh, thank you for joining us on the panel. I'd also like to thank our campus CIO, Associate Vice Chancellor for IT, Jen Stringer, for all of her support, David Wilson, our IT strategic sourcing expert, who's so instrumental when we buy these smart technologies, Rita Rosenthal, lead for communications and helping us get the word out on this whole forum. I'd like to thank David Greenbaum for his work on reimagining IT, including some of the early input and feedback uh, on the connected campus as part of reimagining IT. The connected campus was an official project of reimagining IT in the last fiscal year. Looking farther afield, I'd also like to acknowledge Chuck Benson from the University of Washington for his excellent book, Managing IoT Systems for Institutions and Cities. Anyone who's working on smart campus initiatives would be well uh, served by acquainting themselves with his work. And also to Ben Green, who I'd like to credit with influencing how we're shaping the connected campus here at Berkeley. Ben has done excellent critical thinking and analysis on the challenges of making things smart enough. And with that, we will close the Fall Technology Innovation Forum. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope to see you in the future, and you can keep tabs on what we're doing at cto.berkeley.edu slash innovation.